Now, Mr. Keene, tracer of lost persons in The Case of Murder at a Mile a Minute. Presenting Mr. Keene, tracer of lost persons, a new weekly feature on NBC's all-star festival of mystery, comedy, music, and drama. Brought to you by Dentine, the gum with breathtaking flavor. And Beeman's Pepsin, the gum that's great to chew and good for your digestion, too. By Chesterfield. Sound off for Chesterfield. Get something new, something no other cigarette has. Chesterfield mildness, plus no unpleasant aftertaste. And by Anison, for fast relief from pain of headache, neuritis, and neuralgia. Here's something of interest to you. For breathless moments, for your breathless moments. Chew dentine, the gum with <gasps> breathtaking flavor. Dentine tastes so good. Dentine freshens your breath. Dentine helps keep your teeth sparkling clean and white. Dentine, the gum with <gasps> breathtaking flavor. Before you go out and always after eating, drinking, smoking... Refresh your breath with dentine. You'll love dentine chewing gum, for dentine has a wonderful tingling, nippy flavor that lingers on and on. It's delicious. And remember, dentine helps keep your teeth white, too. Keep dentine handy. You'll enjoy refreshing your breath when you chew dentine. So, for breathless moments, for your breathless moments, chew dentine, the gum with <gasps> breath. Taking flavor. Now, Mr. Keene, tracer of lost persons, one of the most famous characters of American fiction, in one of radio's most thrilling dramas. Tonight, the famous old investigator's case is entitled The Case of Murder at a Mile a Minute. Our scene opens in a city park, bright in the early December sunshine. A new convertible motor car with its top down is cruising along the driveway, and in it are two occupants. One is the driver, a handsome man in his early 40s. The other is an attractive young girl. As they converse quietly, however, they are unaware of the frightful danger which is just about to overtake them. The park is beautiful today, isn't it, Ted? Yes, very lovely, Eleanor. Oh, I'm so glad you asked me to go driving with you. It's good to get away from routine for a while. Eleanor, my dear. Yes? There's something I want to discuss with you, something that's troubling me a great deal. I noticed how preoccupied you were, but I didn't want to say anything until you mentioned it first. That's just like you, Eleanor. I think you understand me better than anyone else in the world. But, Ted, what is it? Why are you worried? It's about... Wait till I pull over a little and let that motorcycle pass. He's coming up behind us. Certainly is noisy. He's got his cutout open and he must be doing 60. Ted, he's coming too close. Well, I've given him enough room to... Ted, look out. Look out. Oh. Oh, for a moment I thought you'd hit that tree. Helen, I... I've been... Ted, there's blood on your coat. Eleanor. Dead. You've been shot. He... He died in my arms a moment later, Mr. King. Before he had a chance to utter another word. And he'd been shot, Eleanor? Yes. As the man on that motorcycle passed us, he fired a bullet into his heart. I saw the man raise his arm, but I, I was so frightened about the car going out of control. I looked away at that instant. The saints preserve us. But that's the nerviest murder I ever heard of. Shooting a man in broad daylight, Mr. Keene. And, and from a motorcycle. My partner, Mike Clancy, is right, Eleanor. Now, tell me, weren't there any witnesses? Didn't anyone get a good look at the killer? No, Mr. Keene. There were people in the park, but 
They didn't know that there was anything wrong until the car stopped and I screamed. The motorcyclist left his cutout open for just that reason, to drown out the sound of the shot. And if Mr. Masters hadn't stopped his car with his last ounce of strength, you might have been killed yourself. Oh. He thought of me, even in the last moment of his life, Mr. Keaton. That was just like Ted. Mr. Keaton, this case has baffled the police, but I won't rest until it's solved. Ted meant a great deal to me. Perhaps not in the way most people thought, but in other ways. How do you mean, Eleanor? Not in the way most people thought. Well, lately the newspaper society columnists have been linking our names, hinting about an early marriage. Was that true? Oh, Ted never proposed to me, Mr. Keene, but I have a feeling that he might have been in love with me. He was older than I. He was 44 and I'm 25. But he was the dearest friend I had. Mike Clancy and I are going to do everything in our power to find that killer. I promise you that, Eleanor. Oh, thank you, Mr. Keene. I had faith that you'd help me, the way you've helped so many others. Tell me, Eleanor, didn't you get a glimpse of the killer's face? Not really. I think he was wearing some kind of a mask. A mask? And some of those motorcycle riders look almost masked, Mike, with the helmets and scarves they wear. At any rate, the killer got away without a single witness to identify him. And when we start a case like this with no suspects at all... Mr. King, th there may be one suspect. Who, Eleanor? Well, perhaps I shouldn't say this. I may be doing Glenn a horrible injustice. But after that scene he made with Ted at the nightclub... Tell me about it in detail, Eleanor. I must have all the facts. It, it happened about two weeks ago, Mr. King. It was Ted's birthday and... We were celebrating at a nightclub in town. Babette was with us, too. Babette? Uh, yes, Ted's daughter. He'd been married before, you see. His wife died years ago and left him with a daughter. How old is Babette, Masters? Twenty, Mr. Keene, and very pretty. It was always odd to think that she could have been a chum of mine, with someone near my own age, and yet I was going out with her father. But we got, got along very nicely. And who is this man, Glenn, you mentioned? Glenn Larkin. He's very hot-tempered. He asked me to marry him once, but I refused. I wasn't in love with him. I see. But the more I saw of Ted Masters, the more angry Glenn became. He took to phoning me and, and even following me around. On the night of the quarrel, he'd evidently followed Ted and Babette and me to the nightclub. He took a table right behind us and started drinking too much. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Teddy. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> oh, you two are wonderful. This is just about the happiest birthday I ever had. Hey, would anyone like to dance with a birthday boy? You go ahead, Eleanor, and dance with Dad. No, Babette, I've been monopolizing Ted long enough. This is your dance. No, I insist. Doesn't anyone want to dance with me? All right, Dad. I'll see that you're not a wallflower. <laughs> yes, Babette. You go ahead and dance with your father. I'll give Eleanor a whirl. Glenn. Having fun, Eleanor? Glenn, you've been drinking too much. Sure. Why not? Uh, this is Mr. Masters, Glenn. Ted, Mr. Larkin, an old friend. A very old friend, Masters. How do you do? Old enough to give her some advice, too. Oh, Glenn, please. I've got no respect for a girl who runs after an older guy just because he's rich. Glenn, I... Eleanor, let me handle this, please. Yes, you handle it, Masters. I've heard about you, Larkin, and what a nuisance you've been making of yourself with Eleanor. Have you? If you don't stay away from Eleanor, I'll have to drum a few manners into your head. Want to have it out right now, Masters? Glenn, if you don't leave this table, I'll never speak to you again as long as I live. All right, I'll go. But you haven't seen the last of me, Masters, and don't forget it. Dad, don't follow him. Leave him alone. I intend to, Babette, for the time being. Oh, he spoiled the party. Ted, I'm so sorry. It's not your fault, my dear. Babette, get your things. You too, Eleanor. I think it's time we all went home. <laughs> I didn't see Glenn Larkin again, Mr. Keene. He stopped annoying me and didn't phone anymore. And you think he may have had something to do with Ted Masters' death? As angry as he was, I'd still never believe it. If it wasn't for one thing... What's that, Eleanor? Glenn... 
Glenn owns a motorcycle. Have you told this to the police? No, Mr. Keene. I, I didn't want to get him in trouble unless I was sure. Where does this young man, Glenn Larkin, live, Eleanor? I'll give you his address. Uh, Mike, uh, take the address down and pick him up. Okay, boss. Uh, bring him over to the master's home. I want to go there first and speak to Ted Master's daughter, Babette. Now, will you come along with me, Eleanor? Oh, yes, of course, Mr. Keene. Uh, what'll I do if this uh, Larkin fella balks about coming over with me, Mr. Keene? Merely give him his choice, Mike. He can do as we ask, or we can turn him over to the police on suspicion of murder. <laughs> Bet, this is Mr. Keene. Mr. Keene? The famous investigator? Babette, I am very sorry to learn what has happened. Mr. Keene has consented to investigate your father's murder. The most brutal thing I ever heard of, Mr. Keene. I loved my father very much. I don't know how I can live without him. Now, now, Babette, try not to break down again. Mr. Keene, this is my father's brother, my Uncle Harry. How do you do, Mr. Masters? How do you do, Mr. Keene? We're all... We're all pretty much in a daze right now, sir. I understand. I've spent all my time here at the house with Babette since... since Ted was killed. I'm a bachelor, Mr. Keene, but I think of Babette as being my own daughter now. If she wants me to, I'll come and live with her. Try to take her father's place. Right now, Uncle Harry, I don't know what I want. I only know... Excuse me, please. Oh, Babette, wait. I'll go up with you. I'll answer that, Mr. Keene. Yes? It's Mr. Keene here. Well, that's my partner, Mike Clancy, Mr. Masters. Oh, please come in. Is this young man also associated with you, Mr. Keene? Uh, no, this is Glenn Larkin, I take it, a friend of Eleanor's. Just what do you want with me, Mr. Keene? What's the idea of sending this big... Easy here? now, me bucko. Watch your manners. Uh, Glenn, perhaps you don't realize it, but you're in serious trouble. Why? Because of Ted Masters' murder? Yes. All right, so I had an argument with him. That doesn't mean I killed him. What about your motorcycle? Oh, I'm not the only one who owns a motorcycle. Glenn. Ellen, was it you who gave Mr. Keene the idea to pick me up? Glenn, I... That was ah. very clever of you. Well, I can also make an accusation. Just what do you mean by that, Glenn? Mr. Keene... The gun the murderer used was found in the road. Well? It's true, a motorcycle passed by Ted's car when he was shot, but that doesn't mean the rider actually fired the shot. Glenn, what are you saying? No fingerprints were found on the gun, Mr. Keene. Just figure it out for yourself. I think I know what you're driving at, Glenn. But I'd prefer you to come right out with it. For all you know, someone sitting right inside that car with Ted Masters fired that shot. Then threw the gun out into the road. I'm saying that Eleanor herself may have killed Ted Masters. Mr. Keene will return in just a moment in the case of murder at a mile a minute. But first, here comes Bing Crosby and Bob Hope with a good angle on Christmas shopping. <laughs> At Christmas time and all the year, it's just a field that brings good cheer with mildness and a better taste. And no one pleasant aftertaste. Sound of or Chesterfield. Sound of or Chesterfield. A Christmas card caught in a milder Chesterfield. That's right! That was the Bing Crosby Quartet you just heard, folks. Dancer, Prancer, Blitzen, and Crosby. And this is Bob Chesterfield Hope reminding you that Christmas is just around the corner. And so is your friendly Chesterfield dealer with a complete line of Christmas gifts including bright Chesterfield Christmas card cartons. Now, that's the perfect gift for any smoker, isn't it? A carton or two of Chesterfields with that Chesterfield mildness plus no unpleasant aftertaste. So for your friends this Christmas, for your own smoking pleasure all year round, take a tip from Bing and me and... Sound off! A Chesterfield! Sound off! A Chesterfield! A Christmas card carton of milder Chesterfield. That's right! Back to Mr. Keene and the case of murder at a mile a minute. Young Glenn Larkin, under suspicion of killing wealthy Ted Masters, has pointed an accusing finger at the girl, Eleanor, who had refused to marry Glenn. Mr. Keene, the great investigator, and his partner, Mike Clancy, together with Harry Masters, the victim's brother, 
stare at the young man in amazement. But then Mr. Keene points to an obvious fact. Glenn, what you just said about Eleanor being the killer of Ted Masters is highly improbable. Is it, Mr. Keene? There would have been powder burns on his clothing if he'd been shot at close range. Besides, what motive did Eleanor have? You're just trying to protect her and get me deeper into this thing. I'm trying to solve this murder case, Glenn. And right now, you're the one I'm most interested in. You'd be better off if you'd confess, young man. It's all right, Mr. Masters. I have a feeling Glenn Larkin will cooperate. Unless he wants to take a chance on being indicted for murder. All right, Mr. Keene. I won't make any trouble. The fact that the gun was found without fingerprints means nothing. The motorcyclist was undoubtedly wearing gloves. And there's no getting away from the fact that the motorcyclist murdered Ted Masters. It only remains to find out now who that person was. It, it wasn't me, Mr. Keene. I swear to it. What were you doing on the day Ted Masters was killed, Glenn? I, I was at work. I'm an assistant manager in a sporting goods store. At what time did the murder occur, Eleanor? It was exactly three in the afternoon, Mr. Keene. And Glenn, can you prove you were in the store at three o'clock? Well, can you? No, he can't prove it, Mr. Keene. I bet. Are you feeling better? Yes, Uncle Harry. Babette, how do you know Glenn Larkin wasn't at the store when your father was killed? Because he was outside this house at 2.30, Mr. Keene, and he left soon after. How do you know? I saw you, Mr. Larkin. You were standing outside. Is that true, Glenn? Yes, Mr. Keene. I, I was here. And when did you return to your work at the store? At, at 3.30. Oh, then, Mr. Keene... He could have caught up with Ted and Eleanor when they left here in Ted's car. I didn't, I tell you. I I didn't even have my motorcycle with me. It was parked in a vacant lot behind the store where it always is. Babette, uh, when you saw Glenn outside the house, did you also see a motorcycle? No. No, I don't think so, Mr. Keene. But, Mr. Keene, what could have prevented him from returning to the store, getting the motorcycle, and catching up with my brother Ted? Ted drove to the park often... Maybe this young man knew that. You're all trying to use me as a scapegoat. I had nothing to do with the murder, I tell you. Glenn, why did you come here to Ted Masters' house that afternoon? I... I received a letter from Masters, Mr. Keene. I had quarreled with him about Eleanor, and he challenged me to meet him at his home and have it out. I... He told me to be here at three. I came early and waited and rang the bell. No one answered, so I left. Did you hear him ring the bell, Ellen, uh, Babette? Yes, Mr. Keene. I didn't answer because he looked ugly. I was afraid of him. Uh, Glenn, do you have that message Ted Masters sent you? No, Mr. Keene. It got me so mad I tore it to pieces. Uh, seems to me this young fellow's in the mighty tough spot, boss. Mike Clancy is right, Glenn. You are. Well, I'm not afraid. I'll go to the police and tell them everything I know. I'm innocent and I can prove it. Perhaps you'd better do that now, Glenn. I will. And Mike will go along with you. Uh, sure, boss. Now come back here after you're through, Mike. Yes, I will, Mr. Keen. Let's get started, young fella. Glenn. What is it, Eleanor? I'm sorry. I'm honestly sorry. Goodbye. Uh, Mr. Keen, I, I think I'd better leave myself. I'll call you, Babette, very soon. All right, Eleanor. Goodbye, Mr. Keen, and thanks for everything. I'm only sorry it had to be Glenn. Oh, this case isn't closed, Eleanor. Glenn hasn't been convicted. I... I'll keep in touch with you. Please do. Goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye, Eleanor. Good night. Babette, I'm going down to the lawyer's office in the morning to see about your father's will. All right, Uncle Harry. Uh, did you handle your brother's business affairs, Mr. Masters? Well, uh, well, not exactly, Mr. Keene. Ted was a much cleverer businessman than I was. That's why he was so successful while I... What were you going to say, Mr. Masters? Nothing. I'm going to bed, Mr. Keene. I'm too exhausted to stay up any longer. Do you want me to stay here overnight, Babette? If you'd like to stay, please do, Uncle Harry. Good night. Good night. Well, I, I've got a club meeting tonight, Mr. Keene. I, I think I'll run down for a couple of hours. Can I drop you off anywhere? I want to wait here for my partner to return, Mr. Masters. You've done a great job on this case. In my opinion, that young man, Glenn Larkin, is guilty. I prefer to wait until I have further proof. However, no matter who the murderer is, I intend to put my hands on him tonight. You mean, even if we've made a mistake about young Larkin? Yes. Uh, 
Have you any ideas? One or two. On second thought, Mr. Keene, I... I think I'll skip the club tonight. I, I'll go inside into the library and, and read for a bit. Shall we say good night now? I believe we'll see each other once more, Mr. Masters, before I go. Yes, Babette. I've been waiting for my partner, Mike Clancy, to return. But it's midnight. Well, something's evidently detained him. Mr. Keene, have you been going through that desk? I took the liberty of doing so, yes. Inasmuch as I'm investigating your father's murder, the desk belonged to your father, didn't it, Babette? Yes. I found this checkbook. Your uncle, Harry Masters, seems to have received a great deal of money from your father. Father lent him money, yes. The last check stub is dated several months ago. Your father doesn't seem to have made out another check to his brother since then. They weren't on good terms, Mr. Keene. No? They'd quarreled bitterly a short time ago. I didn't mention it out of loyalty to my uncle. And what did they quarrel about? Uncle Harry made an investment and lost almost all his money. Father had warned him not to, but he insisted. After he lost the money, he blamed it on father. Even though your father had warned him not to make the investment? He twisted father's words around. Anyway, Mr. Keene, father felt sorry for him, and he helped him out for a while. And then when Uncle Harry demanded too much, father became annoyed and stopped supporting him. That's a lie. No one has ever supported me. Uncle Harry! You're both trying to get me into trouble, but I, I won't stand for it. There's no need to get excited, Mr. Masters. Oh, it's... it's true, Mr. Keene. I borrowed money from Ted, and I quarreled with him. But do you think I'd kill my own brother? It's happened before. Babette knows how fond I was of Ted. Don't you, Babette? All I know is that you've tried to interfere with Father's life and mine for years, Uncle Harry. Oh, don't say that, Babette. Mr. King might think that... <laughs> well, uh, she... She's peeved with me, that's all, Mr. Keene. Ever since I told her that you changed in many ways, well, she's been angry. Changed? How, Mr. Master? Oh, I don't know. Young women are so peculiar these days. They change their appearance so fast you, you hardly recognize them. Hair cut short. That's enough, Uncle Harry. Uh, Babette, uh, this photograph of you and your father here on the piano, uh, how long ago was it taken? We took that on his birthday. A couple of weeks ago, Mr. Keene. I noticed it in particular because I happen to agree with your uncle here. You have changed. What do you mean? In this picture, your hair is long. Almost down to your shoulders. But since then, you've given yourself a very short bob. Like a boy. What's that got to do with anything? May I look inside your room, Babette? My room? It's right here, isn't it? Wait, don't go in there. Mr. Keene, I refuse to have you search my room. Would you mind stepping aside, Babette, just for a moment? Where are you going? I merely want to check this closet. There's nothing in there, I tell you, nothing. No? Do you mind if I look inside this suitcase? Mr. Keene... Babette just taking a gun out of that drawer. Keep away from that suitcase, Mr. Keene. I've already found what I was looking for, Babette. A pair of men's breeches, a motorcycle helmet, and a heavy scarf, which you undoubtedly wound around your face to form a mask. Mr. Keene, you mean Babette killed her own father? I didn't mean to. I loved him. He was my life. It was that woman I wanted to kill, Eleanor. She was taking him away from me. So that was it. When you fired the gun, you missed Eleanor, your intended victim, and killed your father. Why don't you leave me alone? Who asked you to come here? I'll kill you, too. Drop I'll the do... gun, young lady. Oh. Oh. Good work, Mike. How long have you been inside the house? I got your phone message at police headquarters and came over here like you said, Mr. Keene. I came in through the cellar and kept under cover. All right, you have me now. I don't care what happens to me anyway. You certainly went about this crime in a very clever way, Babette. When you witnessed the quarrel between your father and Glenn Larkin, you realized that Glenn might easily be blamed if you murdered Eleanor. You sent Glenn that note, didn't you? Asking him to come here, and knowing that perhaps he'd leave his motorcycle where he always parked it. Uh, she sure had young Larkin pinned against the wall, Mr. Keene. And the first thing that made me suspicious of her, Mike, was the way she came out with her facts. So clearly and calmly in spite of her unhappiness over her father. 
But it was her hair that gave me the strongest clue. You cut it short, Babette, so you'd appear more like a man when you rode that motorcycle. A young woman with your natural beauty doesn't deliberately spoil her appearance without a reason. Mr. Keene, I I still can't believe that Babette... I'm afraid you don't know how clever your niece can be, Mr. Masters. She already had one scapegoat in Glen Larkin, but she was going to add another one by involving you. She only had to take one chance. And it worked out in her favor. One chance? The afternoon of the murder, she didn't see Glenn Larkin waiting outside the house. When he arrived, she was already on her way to the place where he worked to steal his motorcycle. She just took a chance that her note would make him angry enough to come here. And she was right. Why don't you stop torturing me and take me away? I'm not torturing you, Babette. You tortured yourself. In your insane jealousy of your father's friend, Eleanor, you murdered him when you meant to murder her. I'm afraid you're going to pay for your horrible crime, Babette, in full. A terrible thing. A terrible thing. So Mr. Keene finds the solution to the case of murder at a mile a minute. If you suffer from pains of headaches, neuritis, or neuralgia, you should discover what many thousands have known for years, that Anison brings incredibly fast, effective relief. Anison is like a doctor's prescription. That is, anison contains not just one, but a combination of medically proven active ingredients in easy-to-take tablet form. Probably at some time you've received an envelope containing anison tablets from your physician or dentist. Thousands of people have been introduced to anison this way. Try anison yourself the next time you suffer from the pains of a headache, neuritis, or neuralgia. You'll be delighted at how quickly relief can come. Anison is spelled A-N-A-C-I-N. Your druggist has Anison in handy boxes of 12 and 30 tablets and economical family-sized bottles of 50 and 100 for your medicine cabinet. Ask for Anison today. again next week to Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons, a new weekly feature on NBC's all-star festival of mystery, comedy, music, and drama, brought to you by Dentine, the gum with breathtaking flavor, and Beeman's Pepsin, the gum that's great to chew and good for your digestion, too, by Chesterfield. Sound off for Chesterfield. Get something new, something no other cigarette has. Chesterfield mildness, plus no unpleasant aftertaste. And by Anison for fast relief from pain of headache, neuritis, and neuralgia. Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons, is based on the novel Mr. Keene. The radio sequel is originated and produced by Frank and Ann Hummer. Richard Leonard is the director. Philip Clark plays Mr. Keene. Your announcer, Jack Costello. We thank Ed Latimer, who played the role of Mike Clancy, for James Kelly, who was unable to appear. Remember, Mr. Keene is on the air at this same time every Thursday at 8.30 Eastern Standard Time. Don't miss Mr. Keene next Thursday when the kindly old tracer turns to the famous actress murder case. The story of your police force is next on NBC. This RadioVault.com program is a copyrighted presentation. All rights reserved.